Greetings on this first Sunday in the new year. It's good to see you in the house of the Lord. We appreciate your presence. There may be some of you out in the radio listening audience. You intended to be in God's house today, but you got defeated along the way, maybe because of illness or providentially hindered, or maybe you just downright lazy and said, I'm not going to get out in the rain. You let the devil defeat you. But we appreciate you that's here in the house of God today, and may the Lord bless you. Now, this is the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. And this is Preacher Edward speaking. We hope in doing the next hour we can be an inspiration to you through the singing as well as the preached Word of God. And you in the radio listening audience, if you'd just call someone on the phone and have them tune in and get this hour, we will be a blessing to them, I'm sure. And especially some dear shut in. Just call them up and tell them to tune into the station while you're listening and get the Northside Baptist Church Hour with it's coming, coming live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church. Now at this time, Paul will take over and direct the singing, and I'm sure what he has lined up for us will be a blessing to our hearts. So Paul at this time. All right, I want you to turn, will you please, to 1 Kings chapter 13. 1 Kings chapter 13 for the reading of God's Word today. You know, the psalmist said it was good when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. It's good to go into God's house. You should come to God's house and rejoice and praise the Lord and be blessed and strengthened. Not feel like the little boy did sitting in the service and he was sitting there looking at the Christian flag and looking at the, uh, the American flag. And beside the American flag, there were a list of names. Little fellow said to his daddy, he said, Daddy, what are those names there for? And his daddy said, Son, that's the names of the people that died in service. He said, Daddy, which service? The morning service or the night service? So we don't want you to feel like anybody's died in the service here. We want you to come rejoicing and praising God and go out the same way. And so in 1 Kings uh, chapter 13... I want to read a few verses of scripture. It's page 405 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord. Behold, a child shall be born of the house of David, Josiah by name. And upon thee shall he offer the priest to the high places that burn incense upon thee. And men's bones shall be burned upon thee. And he gave a sign to the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the sayings of the men of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand which he put forth against him dried up, so that he could not put it again unto him. And the altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out upon the, from the altar, according to the sign which the men of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king answered and said unto the men of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored me again. And the men of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again, and became as it was before. And the king said unto the men of God, Come home with me, and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. And the men of God said unto the king, if thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so was it charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread nor drink any water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. So he went another way and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. Now I want to speak to you pertaining to this servant, the unnamed servant of God. Now we find here in the scriptures that Jeroboam 
also ruled over ten tribes of the children of Israel. And we find that Rehoboam ruled over the other two tribes. Now Jeroboam, after the Israelites had split and ten tribes had gone north and there joined uh, Jeroboam, and two tribes remained there in Judah, in Judea, and of course under Rehoboam, the son, the son of Solomon, that Jeroboam became very jealous. He knew that God had said Jerusalem is the place for the Israelites to worship. God said, I will establish my name in Jerusalem. And there was a temple built there for them to worship in. And every Israelite knew that that was the place that God had designed for them to worship. But Jeroboam was so afraid that any of the Israelites under his rulership had gone back to Jerusalem to worship, they might be uh, enticed, uh, brought over, bought over by Rehoboam. And he did not want to take any chances on that. So he said, we're going to build a place to worship here in Bethel. And there he erected two golden calves, and one of them here in Bethel. And so uh, Jeroboam would come and worship and offer incense upon the altar here at the golden calf in Bethel. And God hates idolatry. God despised idolatry. And that was pure idol worship, of course. Not only should they have gone to Jerusalem to worship, and when they went, they should have worshipped God. But here they worshipped the golden calf here in uh, Bethel, and it displeased the Lord very much. God said, I don't like that. I'm going to do something about that. I want that altar destroyed. And God moved upon a prophet. He's an unnamed prophet. God never gave his name, but he's out of Judah from around Jerusalem. And God told him to go to Bethel, go to the northern kingdom, and there rebuke uh, Jeroboam, and that the altar would be torn down. And so the man of God was to do what God told him to do. Now what I want you to get out of the message today is this. God told this young prophet exactly what to do. He told him where to go, and then he told him what to do after he had delivered the message. But this young prophet was deceived by an old prophet there after he did what God told him to do. The message I want you to get today is this. When you know the will of God and know what you should do and know it is the word of God and know it is the will of God, then you do exactly that and let nobody deceive you or lead you astray in any manner. And so we find, first of all, a man of God comes to Bethel from Judah. Look at verse 1. And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord under Bethel, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. Here comes this young prophet, and this ruler, Jeroboam, is standing by this altar, offering incense on the altar. He should have not. Secondly, I want you to notice in verse 1 also, that he was a man of God with God's message. A man of God with God's message. He had the message of God. He had the word of God. And at any time a preacher stands behind the sacred desk. And he doesn't give you thus saith the Lord God. He doesn't have God's message. Doesn't try to get God's message for you. Then of course you're practically listening in vain. God wants you to get his word, his message, and God wants his servants to preach the word of God. If you don't have the word of God to preach, then you don't have anything to preach. And so here this man of God had the word of God, and he went there to preach the word of God and warn Jeroboam. And then that brings us to thought number three, and that is he was a man of courage, and he cried against their sin. In verse 2, he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, thus saith the Lord. Now here's a big job for a young prophet. He must go and face King Jeroboam, and he must rebuke him. He must give him the word of God. He must let him know that he's doing wrong. Now that was not an easy job for a young prophet to do, 
but he was God's prophet. He had to have the courage to do it. Now the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ and standing for the truth of God in these days is a man's job. It's not a job for a sissy. It's not a job for a man with no backbone or no courage. The preaching of the gospel is a man's job and the preacher must have courage. He must preach the word of God regardless of who it hits. He must take a stand against evil regardless. And if he's not willing to do that, he's not man enough to do that. He's got no business walking behind the pulpit and saying, I am God's minister. A man of God must have courage. He must not fear the faces of people. He must be willing to preach, thus saith the Lord God, whether people like it or not. That's his job. That's his responsibility. Everybody is not going to like what the preacher preaches. Everybody is not going to agree with him. But when you preach the word of God, we're all going to get hit by the word. And at any time the preacher compromises and refuses to preach the whole counsel of God, then that minister is not doing what he should do. And so this young preacher went to the altar and he took great courage and he faced the king and he told the king exactly what was going to happen. He says, the altar will be torn down. And so he had the message of God. Then that moves us to thought number four. And that is that Jeroboam laid hold on him. Now when this young prophet came and preached against that altar and preached against what Jeroboam stood for, that made the king angry. And the king reached out and grabbed him with his hands. He laid hold on this young preacher. In verse 4, the Bible says it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar and a saying, lay hold on him. And his hand which he put forth against him dried up, so he could not pull it in again unto him. So when King Jeroboam reached out and laid his hand upon the prophet of God, God paralyzed his hand and it dried up. He couldn't even pull it back in. He had no strength. It was completely paralyzed because he had laid his hands on the man of God. Amen. The Bible says in Psalms 105 and verse 15, Touch not my anointed. Now, beloved, listen to me. It's a dangerous thing for any man to lay his hand upon an anointed servant of God. I knew a preacher yonder in South Carolina many years ago, and he's still in the ministry, an outstanding evangelist, a man who's been greatly used of God, and he was preaching around Greenville, and he went down to, I believe, a little town called Easley, and there he preached in a pool room down there. Uh, he was invited to come and preach in a pool room and he went to this pool room and got up on the pool table and started preaching to a large crowd of people. And there's some people that had hated him and they wanted to kill him. They despised him. And a man was to do the job, took his gun, went to the window, aimed the gun at this preacher and was about ready to pull the trigger and his arm was paralyzed. He could not move a finger. He could not pull the trigger on that gun. God Almighty paralyzed that man's hand and he couldn't pull the trigger and kill the man of God. It's a dangerous thing to touch God's anointed. I wouldn't lay my hands on anointed man of God for anything uh, uh, worthwhile, anything you could give me, you might say, because it's a dangerous thing. It's a dangerous thing to do so. And that's what happened here to Jeroboam. We find he laid his hand on the anointed of God to do him harm. God said, touch not my anointed. And he's talking about his anointed servants that preach the word of God. And then we come to thought number five. And that is he prayed for God to heal Jeroboam. Look at verse six. And the king asked and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored to me again. 
And the men of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again, because as it was before. Now I want you to look at this, will you please? Had this been the average Christian, or maybe the average preacher, he'd have said, well, it's good enough for King Jeroboam. He had no business laid his hand on me in the first place. But when Jeroboam saw what had happened and realized that he had done wrong, he repented, he was sorry about that, and he asked the preacher, he said, I want you to pray for me that my hand become normal again. And the man of God said, I will do so. And the man of God prayed for Jeroboam, and his hand was restored back normal again. Now when people mistreat us, abuse us, or do us wrong, and then if they repent of that, and they want us to pray for them, and they want our friendship, and they want forgiveness, then we are obligated to forgive them, and pray for them, and help them in any manner we can. If we don't do that, we're not the kind of Christian that we should be. If anybody has done you wrong and they ask your forgiveness and you don't forgive them, then God will hold you responsible for that. You should forgive any Christian that's asked you to forgive them if they have done you wrong. And so Jeroboam here prayed, or rather the man of God prayed for Jeroboam, and he received his strength back and he could use his arm as usual. And then I want us to notice what Jeroboam tried to do and that's thought number six. Jeroboam tried to reward him or buy him over for what he had done. If you look at verse seven, and the king said unto the man of God, come home with me and refresh thyself and I will reward thee. Now here we find the old king trying to reward this preacher for what he had done, trying to pay him, trying to buy him over. Now God's men are not for sale. You cannot buy a real true man of God over. Now the devil now, if, you can't, if he can't lick you, he'll try to join you and be your buddy. And that's the case here. When Jeroboam saw he could not lick the preacher, he could not overcome the man of God, then he wanted to be his buddy. He said, I want you to come to my house. We'll be friends. I will give you refreshment and I will reward you for restoring back my arm and what you did at the altar. And so you have to be careful now. If the devil can't lick you, he'll join you and become your friend and your buddy. The devil comes as an angel of light and he'll do everything in every way possible to hurt and destroy and to damage you. Now, if the devil can't get you one way, he'll try to get you another. He will come as an angel of light and sometimes even through maybe who you might think would be your best friend. The devil may work through them to keep you from serving God. And he may work through them and they may be led of Satan, not intentionally, to hinder you from serving the Lord. But you must say, get behind me, Satan, and serve the Lord as you have done. And so here we find the old king said, I'll buy him over. I'll invite him into my house. I will feed him and I will reward him. And then we come to thought number seven. And that is that the man of God refused to be bought over. Thank God for ministers that will not sell out. I'm sorry today to say, but it is true. You have many ministers today that sold out to programs and denominations and ecclesiastical powers and overlords. You have some men today in the ministry, I'm sorry to say, and because of the little annuity that they'll draw when they reach a certain age, they go along and support what they know is liberalism and modernism in the movement that they're in. Maybe when they first got into that movement, it was a, a true and, and fundamental. And then finally it apostatized. And rather than to lose that little annuity they're going to draw when they retire, they remain in there and support that movement. 
that is not pleasing to God. It may be that they might not live long enough to draw it. It may be if they compromise that when they do retire, they won't draw it very long because God might be displeased. If God calls a man to preach and God takes care of that man while he's young preaching the gospel, I believe that that same God can take care of a minister when he grows old. I believe that I would want to serve a God that couldn't take care of me in my old days if I burn out for him while I'm a young preacher. But God is not going to let me down in my old days. God will see them taken care of when I grow old. And so God will take care of his children. And so this, uh, this uh, preacher here would not be bought over. In verse 89, And the men of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half of thine house, I will not go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so as it charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, drink no water, nor turn again by the same way thou camest. He said, I will not compromise. I will not go home with you. I will not eat your groceries. I will not be rewarded by you. You have some people, you know, they want to just go along with the crowd regardless. They want to ride the religious bandwagon, whichever way the crowd's moving, that's the way they want to go. Reminded me of the little boy with a big, mean-looking dog. Someone said to the little boy, said, Son, how in the world are you a little boy like you handle that big old mean dog? He said, Well, I just found out where the dog wants to go, and that's where we go. And so you have a lot of people like that today, you know. They want to find out where the crowd's going and where the job would be the easiest and so forth, and they go in that direction. But the real true man of God should stand like the rock of Gibraltar, refuse to compromise, and God will see him through. Now let's move on to the next thought, and that is thought number eight. Here is something here that's very subtle and very cunning. Although this young preacher refused to compromise and go to the king's house, here comes a grave danger, an angel of light coming his way, and he buckles at this point. Now this is what I want to warn you about today. We find an old prophet there uh, in Bethel heard about what this young preacher had done. His sons had been down there and saw what was going on. And this old prophet, the old man, had been laid on the shelf. No doubt had been compromising. Had been in the ministry until he was old man and compromised and God had laid him on the shelf, and he became very, very jealous when he heard about what this young preacher had done. In verses 11 through 13, I want you to look at something. Now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel, the words which he had spoken unto the king. Then they also told to their father. And their father said unto them, What way went he? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went, which came from Judah. And in verse 14, And he went after the man of God. I want you to notice something here. This old prophet that had compromised and had sold out, uh, he went after the man of God. The devil worked through him as an angel of light to get to this young preacher. Now when you know the will of God and you know the word of God and you know what the Bible teaches, let nobody deviate you from that path. I don't care who he is. The devil will come as an angel of light and here he takes this old retired apostatized minister, no doubt that he compromised over the years, and the devil said, I want you to go and tell that young preacher that God said for him to come back to your house and eat and drink in your house. God plainly said to this young preacher, when he left you dear, he said, I want you to go down, go to Bethel, go to the altar, give the message to Jeroboam, tear down the altar, get on your donkey and come back and don't you eat any bread or drink any water while you're down there. That's what God told the young preacher. 
Now this old retired apostate heard which direction the young man went, and there he took off after him. His sons had told him, he said, they, they said, Pa, a young preacher came down here, you should have seen what he'd done. Well, immediately the old man became very jealous. He said, well, we don't want any young preachers around here doing anything we can't do. I, I think I'll go take a look at him and see what we can do about it. And so he takes off after him, and he said, I'll go and uh, take off after the man of God. Now notice number nine, where he finds him. In verse 14, he finds a young preacher sitting under an oak tree. In verse 14, he went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. There's a message there for every one of us. After you have done the will of God, it's no time to sit down under an oak. Amen. It's no time to stop. It's no time to go to sleep. You must keep on keeping on. You might say, well, I've done a good job. I think I'll just retire. I'll just sit down under an oak. Now, when he sat down under that oak tree, that was the wrong thing for him to do. This old apostate preacher came riding up on his donkey. He saw the young preacher sitting under this oak. Had this young preacher continued on down the road, he could have been a long way toward home. And maybe the old apostate could never overtake him. But you know what happened? When he saw that young preacher sitting under an oak, let his guard down, taking off his hat, no doubt, resting, relaxing. He had done the job God told him to do, and he took down his guard, unloaded his gun, as it were, and there he was sitting there wide open for the devil to really weighed in on him. And that's exactly what happened. If you read verses 14 through 19, I won't take time to read them, you'll find that this old apostate preacher lied to this young prophet. He comes up to the young prophet, and the young prophet noticed immediately that he was an old preacher because of the way he dressed. He could tell by the clothes he had on that he was an old prophet. And the old prophet said to the young preacher, he said, Son, I heard about what you did in Bethel. I want to commend you for what you've done. I want you to know I've been the prophet around here for all these years. God has blessed me and I've been the chief preacher around this crowd and in this particular place. And son, the Lord just told me to come and tell you that you're tired and hungry. Of course, you know that. And the Lord just told me to tell you to come back to the old prophet's house and have a good meal and eat and drink and rest a while because the journey is long. And then after you eat and drink, then you can get on your donkey and you can go back to Judea. And this young preacher listened to that old preacher and the old preacher lied to him, told him a lie. And the young preacher thinking, well, he's an old prophet. He's an old man of God. And if God told him to come and tell me, to go back to his house and eat and drink, then I better go back and eat and drink. And that's why he made the mistake. The same God that told him when he left Judea not to eat and drink anything there around Bethel, around Samaria, but to go do the job, get on his donkey and come back, eat nothing and drink nothing. And the same God that gave him the message before he left if he had he wanted him to eat and drink in the prophet's house, he could have told him he would not have to work through that old prophet to tell him. And the young preacher didn't realize that being a young man of God. He thought he'd better listen to the old apostate. I've had preachers to come to me, older fellows, you know, when I was a young preacher and say, well, Brother Edwards, you better kind of line up with the crowds, you know. You're going to need your brethren when you come to the end of the journey. Well, I knew what God wanted me to do. And this young preacher knew what God wanted him to do. And God could have told him to go and eat at this old prophet's house if he'd wanted him to have done that. But God told him not to eat a bite or drink anything on that trip. That was final. That was the word of God. And so when you know God has saved you and you know what God wants you to do, let nobody change your mind if you know it is the will of God without a shadow of a doubt. 
See, the devil worked through this old apostate prophet to deceive the young preacher and to tell him a lie. And so there he said, all right, I'll go back. Now, when you know the will of God, listen not to those that would change you, whether it be angels or spirits or visions or preachers or whatnot. If you know the will of God well and good, you better let nobody change you from the will of God. Many times old preachers that have played out and apostatized will try to advise you as to what to do. I'm speaking primarily now to younger, about younger preachers. And then they'll get you off the right track. If God has spoken to you one time, he can speak to you again. And you know what happened? This young preacher listened to that old man, went back to his house, sat down, ate and drank, laughed and had a good time. And then he got on his donkey to leave. And God said, you, you've really fouled up. You'll never get back home. You're going to die on the highway. And this young preacher went out down the highway and a lion came out and destroyed him. A lion is a type of the devil. He listened to that old man when God already told him what to do and it cost him his life. When you're in the will of God and know the word of God and serve in God, you do what God says in this book. Let nobody turn you aside from the will of God if they do, it might could cost you your life. That's exactly what it cost this young man. Let's stand to our feet. Dear Father, I pray today in Jesus' name that you'll take this message, that you'll penetrate it into the hearts of many people, and help us, dear Lord, to know when we know the will of God, not to turn aside but to set our face like a flint to be used of thee and let nobody tear us away from the right track but to move straight down the road to the glory of God. Have you in this invitation, Father? I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now, while the ladies play on the instruments, if you're in this building on this first Sunday in this new year, you'd like to get saved to come back to God or join the church for any reason, you want to come down here while they play a stanza, so would you come? How about it? Is God speaking to you? Would you like to join the church? Would you like to get saved? Would you like to come back to God? Or for any reason, is God speaking to you? Thank you.